Bang ding ding, trademark. Ah, he come out. Six foot seven tall. Bang ding ding, one is star. <laughs> Welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is Dan Abate. Dan is an entrepreneur, thought leader, investor, and co-founder at 81C, a company that is pioneering entrepreneurship as an asset class, enabling anyone in the world to invest in businesses that would typically never be available to the public. In addition, Dan brings a career-long focus on business process automation and the use of advanced technology in organizational development and improvement to coach our audience to build better and more efficient businesses of their own. Here to talk about the work he's doing to create a mindset shift around the idea of entrepreneurship as an asset class, utilizing automation in your business to build powerful, efficient, money-making machines, and in the meantime, how not to be replaced by a robot. Please join us in welcoming to the show, the incredible Dan Abate. Hey, Dan, how are you, man? Good, good. How are you doing? Very good. Hey, welcome to the show. Glad to uh, have you here, and we really appreciate making the time for us. For sure, for sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, Dan, uh, I was wondering if maybe you could just give us a brief overview of your work history and your educational background. It's I, I know it can't be brief because there's like Harvard and a bunch of other. Yeah, there's a lot in there. If you could maybe just give us a an overview right. of your your background. I'll try. I'll try to give the short version and I'll touch on the parts that I think are most important to me that are, are um, meaningful to me, I guess is a good way to say it. So um, I grew up in. Um, a manufacturing household. My dad was in manufacturing. His dad was in manufacturing. So that was my experience with companies and entrepreneurship and all that sort of stuff. Um, I started working with uh, his CFO when I was 14 years old, just sitting next to him and like learning how, like what the, what accounting is basically. And then like kind of started there. Um, I was also uh, at that time, uh, probably, you know, this was the early nineties was the guy who knew the most about computers because no one in that place knew anything about computers. So I somehow by, you know, became the de facto computer advisor guy. Um, I went to college at 15. I went there initially uh, to study theater, but then switched to philosophy because I liked it so much. And then later on continued, as you noted, um, with uh, math and physics degrees, a whole bunch of like business stuff and, um, you know, finance and all that sort of stuff over my, this whole time, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner type person. So um, I've got a whole 20 year plan still ahead of me wow. um, as far as academics and stuff go. So I'm super excited about that. Anyway, I went, went to college while I was in college. Um, I started a small tech uh, startup, which was basically selling traffic to Wall Street firms. Now we're kind of getting into like the, you know, mid to late nineties. Um, and I sold traffic to them until one of them bought me when I was 19 years old and I sold that, uh, and had a nice little bit of an exit, not nothing life changing, but enough to be able to say, okay, now what do I do? Um, and then I focused my attention from that point on, on basically acquisitions, uh, with a focus on automation and process optimization to increase cash flow, which of course increases value. Um, and I learned about consolidations and the acquisitions and stuff back in my dad's business when he was acquiring um, companies and consolidating them into his manufacturing company. So um, did that until 2013. Uh, once I sold kind of everything and decided, hey, before I go on to my ne- the next step of my journey, let me move to Florida. So I moved from Chicago, where I where I born and raised, uh, moved down here to Florida, Palm Beach County. 
Um, and um, I've been here ever since. And I've, and, I, and I've really expanded my reach since moving down here because my focus when I was acquiring companies with the automation and optimization and kind of flip, fix and flip scenario, I really put myself, I was the CEO. I acquired the company, put myself in charge, and then I made it all happen, right? And so that worked and I made money with that, um, but it didn't really, um, two problems with it. One, it wasn't scalable because it was completely dependent on me um, putting myself into these different positions um, and you only have so much time. And second, I wanted to, um, I, could, there was, I was doing 20% of what I liked and 80% of what I didn't like. I was like, how am I gonna do 100% of what I like and what I'm you know, highest and best use and where I can really drive the most value and kind of like get rid of the rest of it. And frankly, it, it really took, um, you know, what was that, 2013? So we're talking about, you know, eight years. Um, it's really taken like a good five, six of those years, first time here in Florida, when I was here in Florida, to kind of figure out how to do it. And uh, I'm happy to report over the last couple of years, I think I've very clearly figured out how to do it. <laughs> so I've merged the two things. So anyway, sorry, that's the, that's the high level overview. One thing that I really like about that story is um, sitting down with the CFO at 15 years old and being able to glean that knowledge from him. And I'm sure having that experience and being able to work with your dad's company and work with someone with that knowledge at such a young age, put thoughts and ideas into your head that you wouldn't normally have as a normal 15 year old that you wouldn't normally have as someone who's, you know, going out mowing lawns as a kid, just trying to make a few extra bucks. You're thinking of business acquisitions and, and actual legit stuff as a young kid. And it, and it shows by your first exit at 19, which is crazy. So I just think yeah. that's really neat. That yeah, you're so I was, I, I, yeah, super, super, definitely, definitely was a um, great experience. And, and for the, all the reasons that you said, I would just, I would um, mention to anybody that the, the key there is, is being willing to listen because there was a phase in my career after the exit and pretty much before moving to Florida, kind of that whole stage of the early 2000s where my mindset was very close. Like I kind of had it figured out, quote unquote figured out. And um, I wasn't as open as I was back when I was 15, right? And so the, the irony of that was, is that in my non-openness, um, I was not, um, I stopped learning sort of, like I did, I learned, but I wasn't, I was solving it all myself all the time which because I thought that I was smart and I thought that I can do anything kind of thing as many entrepreneurs think they are and can, and they, and they can, don't get me wrong, but I found kind of in, you know, the last bit of my life, the last couple of years, that the more you can um, learn from others and the more you can listen from, uh, listen to others um, and learn from their experience so you don't have to go through those trials and tribulations um, is kind of like key to success and key to like, and, and when I say success, I don't mean just financial success. I mean, like kind of internal, um, kind of happiness and being in the right place for who you are as a person. Cause that's not generic. Like financial success is generic. We all get the same dollars at the end of the day, but I've known lots of people who've made tons of money and are miserable. And I've known other people who've just kind of had moderate financial success, but are, fantastically happy and loving life. So if I had to choose who I wanted to be, I would definitely choose the loving life guy because that's really what it's all about. We all get to the same place in the end anyway. So um, if you're not having fun with it at the same time, then why bother? Yeah, very true. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think it actually leads into a little bit, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, poked at it in the introduction, the idea uh, of not being replaced by a robot. And I think in uh, a, around 2015, you did a TEDx talk around, uh, you know, by that name, you know, how not to be replaced by robots. Yeah. And the reason for that talk was that you had by then become sort of an expert in automation and using technology as a way to scale and grow businesses and sort yeah. of reduce the number of humans in the process. And, um, you know, so I think a lot of people might, you know, gut reaction might be like, ooh, that's kind of yucky. You know, why are we trying to replace all the people? But, you know, the, the way your talk is, and, and spoiler alert, I don't want to kill it for everybody, but so much of, of, you know, not being replaced by a robot is putting more and more emphasis on 
the things that make you human. And I believe that that is sort of what you're alluding to here, you know, and I almost wonder if some of that is just kind of a natural evolution. As we get older, we stumble upon that truth. And uh, so I wonder, I I say all that to preface a discussion on automation. And if we can maybe go back and talk a little bit about your trajectory or your pathway through sort of purchase, acquisition, consolidation, and sale, because that whole route was done in this really automated way. I think a lot of people think of of business acquisition as, okay, well, now I'm moving into a company, I got to do all the work. But your approach was really, how do I reduce this down to, you know, sort of the, the least amount of human involvement possible? So right. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and then just sort of, you know, how, how that relates to what you've learned over the years. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so the first thing that jumps to mind in regards to the um, do the work that's more human, as, the, as my TED Talk alludes to or, ta- or says, um, I mean, think about it. If you can, like, especially now, especially 2015 and even still today, um, if I can build a relatively inexpensive piece of software to replace the work that you do, odds are you're probably not super fulfilled from doing that that work. I mean, like, because a computer isn't very smart or creative or imaginative or emotional or all these things that humans are, and that we, in some form, one of those things that I just mentioned, you probably get some positive feelings about, like and that you want to do more of that thing. The computer doesn't do any of those things. So if I can replace you with software that does that, you need to find something else to do. And like, you know what I mean? Like it's better for you anyway, in the long run. It may in the short term, you know, it's not great, but, um, but in the long term, I think it produces a lot of opportunity for us as a species to make better use of our, you know, true talents. So that was kind of the, the first part of that. Second part, the acquisition part of it. Yeah. So my strategy was strictly around the idea that, um, so if you're going to do a regular acquisition, like a merger acquisition consolidation type thing, kind of like what my dad was doing, right? You have two companies, they have a bunch of redundant um, overhead and a bunch of redundant things. And so when you put them together, you can take your kind of profit per job or profit per unit or profit per customer, whatever you want to say, which was your, you know, contribution margin to your overhead and just lump that into your existing overhead and make a whole bunch of money because now you can cut one of the overheads basically, right? Pretty straightforward consolidation sort of stuff. So my model was the kind of doing the same thing, but we were cutting it out of the, um, we were basically capturing the dollars that were trapped in the inefficiency of human beings in the process, right? So like if I can increase efficiency by 50%, whatever that dollar amount is, was kind of found money that was in there the whole time that I was a set, that the company was paying out in order to um, continue to run inefficiently. So that was essentially the model. And what, what I was able to do in most cases, uh, eight acquisitions, um, six were profitable. One of them was kind of break even, and then one of them was a stinker. So the odds were pretty, you know, we did pretty good um, as far as you know success goes. And um, what was really successful about it, or what really worked about it, was that in most cases I was able to conceptualize what we were going to do during the diligence process. So even before we closed, so maybe we made a deal. Like we, we kind of said, okay, here's the deal. You want this much money and, or, or whatever the deal is and great, we agree to that. Let's go into diligence. And then you go into your standard diligence process, which is you know, verifying the numbers, verifying the customers, verifying the employees, the processes, the systems, they kind of let you look under the hood, right? So we didn't tell anyone this, but while we were looking under the hood, we were also simultaneously designing the new workflows and new processes within the company where we identified the most potential inefficiency. Like we were, that's really what we were most interested in, you know? So while the kind of accountants and lawyers and all that were doing their kind of standard stuff, kind of our systems people, myself and the others, um, were looking more at the, the processes side of things. So what we'd actually be able to do in some cases is um, in one case in particular, which was the most kind of extreme example of this, um, we were able to design the system, build it, and there was a risk because if for some reason the deal didn't close, we would have built something for nothing, but build it, 
um, all before we closed. So then once we closed on the deal, we actually did not take any of the people into the new company that we were going to lay off because of the process stuff. So like, no, there wasn't even like a transition because it was so simple. It was such a straightforward example that we saw that they previous owners didn't and didn't know what to, didn't know. And, um, and so we were able to make all of the adjustments to everything at like closing basically, which was pretty cool process and everything. Um, so that was really the strategy was, was to be able to um, look ahead, build the systems, get them implemented uh, as quickly as possible. And then um, once they were up and running, kind of fix and flip, you know, try to find the next person to sell it to that they wanted them to take advantage of that new efficiency and new profit. Well, and one thing I think is particularly interesting about your trajectory is that the, the types of businesses you were choosing weren't necessarily, I think, what might come to mind for most people. So for example, if, you know, if I'm running a small business and I was thinking about how I might use implementation, you know, maybe what comes to, or uh, automation, excuse me, what comes to mind is, you know, hiring uh, or buying a robot to flip hamburgers or, you know, a, a new piece of software or something to do some sort of job for me. But what I'm not thinking of, and the one that I think that intrigued me the most was your live, uh, uh, live performance venues. Uh, yes. Because I think that those are, are things that people wouldn't traditionally sort of associate with automation. Right. Now, what you automated might be processes and, and you know, I, I, I don't know, I'll, you can elaborate, but I mean, you know, it, the basics, the software issues, but you were actually able to get it down to a very few, you know, least number of people necessary to actually right. be full-time employees. So yeah. I think that that might be an, an interesting caveat or an interesting addition to this story for our listeners who might not be sure how automation fits in their company. That's a, that's a great, a great point. It doesn't, everything, it, the, the highest opportunity for technology and automation is where technology and automation doesn't already exist. So like looking for those kind of oddball places that you can apply it is really where you see your most value. Not to mention that like, it's worth mentioning, it's worth mentioning that like you, I'm glad you brought up the theater example because um, the theater was a combination of technology and business model that made that so successful. And for as long as it was successful, um, because you have to look at the business model at the same time in this particular case. And many times, um, that's a lot of what I do now is, is there's a lot of focus on business model stuff. Um, let's just use that as an example because somebody, everyone can understand it. So live theater venue, you know, what are the two busiest nights of live theaters? Friday and Friday, Saturday, Saturday, right? And then maybe you got Thursday and maybe you got something on Sunday afternoon. That's kind of the, the meat of it. Unless you're, you know, I don't know, cats are wicked on Broadway where you're running, you know, 20 shows a night for all week and packing them in traditionally regular theaters, especially small venues, uh, live venues, clubs, all these categories fall into that. We have to make all our money Friday and Saturday night. And in a theater's um, place, a lot of times what they would do is they would set up um, like, you know, you set up like an eight week run or a 12 week run of one show. You build out the set, you put all the lights up just for that show. And then you run your show Friday, Saturday, eight o'clock, and then you lock the doors and you come back <laughs> five days later and then you do it all over. And then everyone's confused on why they don't make any money and like why they're going broke and like why they, like they're always in this turmoil. So our um, theaters, we own three at one point, uh, live venues. Uh, we basically profited, uh, well, uh, let, me get the, let me get the numbers right. We had, you know, 12 to 15 times the revenue of our next closest competitor. Wow. And our profit was like three or four times their gross revenue all year. And how we did that was, is we just focused on the idea of asset utilization. This is another advantage for people who are interested in this sort of like, where are the opportunities? Um, finding industries are weird kind of niches where people who are operating in them are not business people, like they're, or, or they didn't get in it to be in business. Those are good opportunities because this is basic stuff. If I have an asset and it's not making me money, it's costing me money. So I need to keep it busy, right? Like super easy. Um, and then a willingness to build a business model and stick to it that might be against the trend in the industry. So like in the theater business, it took us a while. Um, it didn't take us a while. That's not the right way to say it because it happened quickly. 
it, it took a real commitment because people were pressuring us to stop doing it that way because it didn't fit the traditional approach. You know, so we basically told people, we don't care what night of the week your show is, you're not going to set up a, a, a set because if you put one set on the stage, now you can't put any other shows on the stage. It's got to be rotating. So you can set up as crazy of a setup as you want, but you got to be able to take it down in 30 minutes because I got to put another show on stage. So like our Saturday night, which other theaters were running one show, we were starting at like 1030 in the morning and then running different shows with different sets, with different casts, with different show, you know, the whole thing from 1030 in the morning to the last one started at like midnight. You know, so like whatever that is, seven or eight shows, nine shows in, uh, in, in that day. And then we were running shows on Tuesday at 1030, like we had everything going. Um, so that was the business model. And then on the automation side of it, which was key, was we built a whole custom software package for ticketing, uh, mainly, I guess ticketing is really the main thing, because we had to facilitate the turnover of people in the, in the show, in the venue. We couldn't have this kind of like, piece together system where people are like swiping credit cards and then they're like buying online through one system which doesn't talk to your internal system and then you've got like box office people handing out paper tickets like we got rid of all of that like basically everything worked online um, and we started building that system back in 2003 so like this was like really ahead of it and then that same system in its original form of course updated along the way carried the business from 2003 till 2018. So like wow. it was good software that we built and, um, and you know, a bunch of different venues, different locations, um, even some remote locations where we did, um, you know, in, went into venues that we didn't own. Um, what was I saying about that? Yeah. So anyway, so that was the point was, is that the software portion of it was um, all about limiting friction and people in, in the mix, because the more people there were, the slower it made the process of, getting people in and out of the venue. So I actually, um, I really like that story because I've worked in the live music and music venue industry for quite a while. Uh, there's a venue in uh, Tacoma, Washington called Jazz Bones, where I would actually perform from 10 o'clock till two. But before that, they had a band, they had a comedian, they had, exactly. you know, but they would stack the day up where they would have different stuff going on all the time and, and did exactly what you said was just be able yes. to get one crowd, an early dinner crowd for a comedian, and then get a completely rotation starting at 10 o'clock where the, that crowd leaves. And it's a completely different thing. It's a, a nightclub for the night, you know, and, and I loved that exactly. kind of business model because they had so many more people coming through the door versus just, Hey, we're a nightclub and we just do a DJ, you know? So Correct. I, I relate yeah. with that. And then also the ticketing yeah, and process. From a marketing perspective. Yeah. Well, and, and with your integrated system with the ticketing, that right there changes the whole dynamics of the equation. So I, I really like that story. Um, did you go into theater knowing anything about it or did you just kind of that was an opportunity? Let's see how this goes. Or did you pursue that as a as your first venture? Yeah, great. Great question. So the way that I got into that was while I was in college, I joined an improv team, like so okay. many people in Chicago, <laughs> like so many people in Chicago do. Um, and then when I sold my internet company, I, I was just kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to go back and do math and physics at University of New Mexico. And then while I was in University of New Mexico, there was really no improv place in Albuquerque, New Mexico, of all places. So I was like, I'm going to start an improv theater like just because and then they were doing this downtown revitalization thing and so instead of just starting a group i was like i'm going to buy a building and i'm going to redevelop it and so i did i bought a building right in their main downtown area uh it was, and built a 200 seat theater on the first floor 100 seat theater on the second floor rehearsal space office space on the second floor as well and started a theater um and then kind of figured out the business model while I was in New Mexico. And then it was like, hey, this actually works. I should bring it back to Chicago where there really is a big community of producers and artists. Um, and then that's what I did. And then the Chicago location opened and then we bought a third location um, a couple of years later in a, in a suburb near there. That's great. Yeah. yeah, it's always interesting to hear how people got into a certain field, you know, when they're not really in theater or whatever, but they ended up in it or they end up buying a yeah. restaurant and they're doing this and it, it yeah. the backstory is always fun to hear 
Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think it's interesting too to hear, you know, especially as it pertained to these venues, but really as it pertained to all the businesses you're running in that automation isn't necessarily yet the enemy, right? I mean, you're a little tongue in cheek or uh, tongue in cheek with the idea of don't be replaced by a robot, but the concept really is that, you know, it, the automation is really uh, just another tool, right? This is another thing we Correct. can employ to do a better job, you know, or be more efficient or whatever. And so you really illustrate that in the story of the this venue, you know, how it was, the automation wasn't, you know, robots to adjust your lights for you. It was rather, it was just the business model and the processes that allowed you to turn around tickets quickly or to make sure that all the systems were communicating with one another. So I think it's really useful to hear these different types of automation, I think, because I think, A, I think automation has become one of those buzzy words that people just say to mean, you know, email marketing or something. But it <laughs> right, really exactly. mean anything. And so I think automation is one of these sort of misunderstood things, but I think also there is, you know, this fear of change and, and that sort of thing. And I think there is, you know, e even if we're joking about being replaced entirely, I mean, ultimately there is a change taking place. Technology is facilitating a change. And there's another uh, story you mentioned uh, where you were talking about have, having done this automation process for, I believe it was some sort of like legal video company or something mm. like that. Yeah. And uh, what I thought was interesting about that one in particular is first of all, the idea that you were, cause you still needed to have people making videos, right? So, I mean, there's automated processes yet those automated processes are, are interacting with, you know, real life humans that have to do some jobs. And then also I liked the, or what I thought was particularly interesting, and this might be an opportunity for other entrepreneurs or people who are interested in automation as a service, um, identifying situations like this where people are, are doing things in an old fashioned way. You know, now granted this has been a lot of years, but I, I happen to know that there are a few industries out there that still do things in sort of antiquated ways. You know, I do a lot of work in and around like real estate titles and escrow and things like that. Super old school, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, so to talk about automation is a, a way to bring those things not only into the future, but make them much more efficient. And I think you mentioned earlier, the idea of finding money, you know, there's found money in there because you've been doing these things anyway, just now you can do them in half the time. So I wonder if you just sort of maybe, uh, maybe we could talk about that story in particular, just sort of how automation worked in that particular instance. Yeah. So, um, that particular instance, um, is a good example of, um, so basically how that business shook out was you still had to have the guys in the field, right? Because you couldn't send robots out with cameras and all that sort of stuff. So you had to have those guys in the field. But they're, they're, the opportunity there was is that it was all paperwork, like, like especially because it's legal too. You have to be very precise to make sure you get all the numbers and letters and everything right and all the documents that were associated with it. And you also had to, there was also a lot of changes. I don't know if anybody who's in the, worked in the legal business trials and lawyers and all that, they're always changing the schedule for whatever reason they're changing the schedule. So the problem with that business was, us going into it, was that there was just so much change the, you know, schedule change. Oh, great. Now we got to update this 20 different ways, or there's a new, there's something over here that happened that was not what we expected. Now we got to go back to all of our paperwork and our manual systems and our like our calendar that we update manually and all these things. Like it was just like, it was like, it was an accident waiting to happen. Basically there was like the potential for human error, like that alone was a reason to fix it. Um, so really with that one, it really was a, um, an automated portal that the video guys out in the field could access that gave instant um, updates and um, to both the schedule and to whatever was going on with the particular case back to the home office so that that way when in the, at the time when the tapes came back to the office and the video editing guys got it they could um they knew exactly what they had to do there was no community there was no you know lag in communication everything was all um ready to go and kind of that was kind of the end of the process at the beginning of the process during the scheduling phase when you have to send out all of your um you know your notices and you have to like update all the stuff as it relates to like you know, getting everyone on the same page, that was completely automated. That was just, you know, everybody has their own logins, everybody can see the calendar and they're looking at the same thing. I had a friend once in the in the automation kind of world who used to always say one version of the truth. There's one version of the truth, one database that if it says that date, that's the date that everybody sees. Like there isn't like 20 different versions of it. Because the problem is, is what these, these people were doing was because they were doing everything manually, they were 
creating PDFs of whatever it is that they had to send out. So they would create a PDF, send it out to like five different people, like different lawyers, whatever. Something would get changed. They'd have to send, take a new, like make a new PDF with the slight change and then send it out again. So now you've got two different PDFs that are basically the same, except for this one minor change, sent out to five or six people. Now multiply that over a couple month period and multiple changes, and it's just like a mess. So um, that was kind of the focus on that one in terms of like making it work. But the thing I wanted to point out was um, that entrepreneurs in general should be aware of is that um, is that that um, like like when they think of their hourly rate, like uh, there's a book by um, Rob Slee, his name is, and it's called Time Really Is Money. And it's essentially um, the idea that entrepreneurs need to think of, they've got to be aware of the, where they spend their time. And then I've kind of extrapolated from that too. They have to be aware of where their employees spend their time. Because if you're paying somebody $20 an hour and you've got them in some sort of workflow process that has them doing a job that's really a $10 an hour job, you're overpaying by $10, right? And it's the same thing if you're the entrepreneur. If you are kind of wearing a lot of hats because you're just starting out or whatever, that's fine. But you've got to be aware when you're doing a $10 an hour job or a $100 an hour job or a $10,000 an hour job, right? Like I want to focus as much of my time on those $10,000 an hour things. And I'm literally talking $10,000 an hour. Like it's, I'm not exaggerating because there's other people who work for a million dollars an hour, right? Like that's the point. Like the whole point of Rob Slee's book is that you have to work your way up that hourly rate, like, you know, ladder. Um, but in the way that you do that is rung by rung. You can't jump ahead. Like if you're, if you're at a $20 an hour type situation, you're not going to jump to $1,000 an hour tomorrow. What you're going to do is you're going to be at $20. You're going to bring someone in behind you who's going to take your $20 hour slot so you can jump yourself up to $50. And then you're going to do that for a while. And then you're going to let go of your $50 one, let someone else do that. And you're going to jump up to $150 and you just kind of keep working your way up. And then your viewpoint and your perspective gets higher and higher. And perhaps your time frame gets longer and longer in terms of what you're looking at. And you're not so focused on the day to day, but you're looking further out in time, making like longer term decisions. Um, and that's how you get yourself up, you know, kind of how you grow your business. And, and you have to do that as the, if you're the COO or you're playing the COO for your company as the entrepreneur founder, you have to kind of have that same thought process for all of your employees and all of your workflow processes within your business. Because again, if you're paying $20 an hour and it's something that I can write a piece of code for 500 bucks, I'd rather just write a piece of code and then eliminate it completely. Now it doesn't cost me 20 bucks an hour anymore, right? But I have to be aware of that as a possibility. So, so um, can you talk about that process of like an acquisition? You're going in, you're buying it. I, I read on your uh, Medium article that ac acquisitions always take longer than expected. But sure. those processes that you're defining and trying to figure out, um, how do you approach a company and come in and figure out this $20 an hour job can be replaced with the $500 piece of code or this yeah. or that. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, you have your own systems and your own way of thinking of it, but in the actual due diligence process, how has that worked for you in the past as far as defining those breaking points um, and then fixing them and moving yeah. forward? Yeah, I guess it's really all, it's all dependent um, based on. The, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I bet it's all dependent based on what job you're coming into or what company you're taking over because different systems and processes apply in different um, situations. So really it's a matter of just being able to step back and look at a broad overview, right? And just kind of be able to see. Yes. It's the, it's two things. It's two things. It's you have to have a high enough view. Like you're saying, you have, well, let's call it three things. Actually, you have to have a high enough view that you can see all the pieces working together in order to determine, like if you're inside the company and you, and you can't see that or your mindset just won't allow it, you can't see it. Okay, cool. So you, first you have to be able to see it. Um, two, you have to be able to have the control to make it happen. 
So this is the issue that like say blockchain is a technology has when people start talking about, we can use blockchain to, you know, like create accountability in the shipping industry. Perfect. So you got a high level view and you have like a, like a concept of how it's going to work. You've identified the issue, which is like, to your point, like, okay, we've identified the $500 piece of code. Now I can control the whole shipping industry using blockchain. The th my second maxim though is not fulfilled because how do you execute that, right? I can't simultaneously in one shot get all of the shipping people across the whole world to utilize my new blockchain solution. So there has to be like an entry point where whether it's a macro level thing like blockchain in the shipping industry or whether it's acquiring a company and we're only working on a particular part of the process, we have to have an entry point at which we can um, that we can make it happen. We have the authority to make it happen and we can do that in a practical way. You know, I mean, it's the same, it's the same issue with, with anything where there's a big macro level change, whether it's world or on a company scale, um, you have to be, be able to take the intermediate steps to be able to manage the change. I think one of you said earlier about how it's all about change and change can be scary or something about change. Um, it's change management. It's being able to, you know, it's, it's as much a process of managing the change within the organization as it is conceptualizing the process and the systems and then implementing them. You have to, you have, to have a change management plan as well. Um, and depending on how complex the system is and how many different people it's going to affect um, or worse customers that it might affect, because now you really, now you're playing with revenue a little bit. Um, you, you've got to be, you got to have that all figured out in advance. And um, Sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's hard, but a lot of it is um, just being aware that's a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, like that's a big part of it. Um, in that yeah, same article. That yeah. In that same article, you talked about um, getting rid of the middle managers. So I, I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of issues in that when you acquire something that they're doing these processes their way and actually pulling them out of the equation, it probably opens that whole door to be able to do what you want to come in and implement without having the backlash. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So in these uh, sort of last 20 minutes or so, I wondered if we could start uh, pivoting into a, a little bit of discussion about 81C. Um, what I think is interesting or sort of what really got me thinking about it, and actually I think it segues nicely off of what we've been talking about so far, is you, you mentioned in there early on that you were doing a lot of work that you didn't love. You were doing, you know, maybe 20% of things you like, 80% of things you didn't. And, you know, at some point you were maybe a little more able to, uh, you know, I guess, find your path or, or choose a passion and then sort of pursue it. Is that sort of where 81C comes in? No, actually, 81C is more of a technical um, machine. The find your path part of it is, is, the, is kind of what I've been doing the last two years. So 81C was basically uh, uh, our opportunity to create a public company with the SEC, like totally legal, um, with the SEC that utilized blockchain technology for tokenization of equity, right? Like that was kind of like, that's what that is. And that, that machine, that um, is what we built with that. And so, um, you know, there's some financing opportunities with that. That's kind of like what that was from 2018, I guess is when that was. Um, and in the late 2019 is when I kind of found my, um, approach that has allowed me to really scale my kind of investing and advising opportunities um, because it all really it really comes down to investing at the end of the day but um, what I determined was is that I wanted to approach that the thing that I was annoyed with in my conversation was every time I'd start like do some sort of business thing is, is I always had to do sales. I don't think I wrote anything. I have something written that I haven't published yet. That's kind of about this, but I'm not a sales guy by any means. I'm a very much a connection relationship person. Like I love to talk to people. I love learning about people. I love 
hearing about what they're passionate about and then figuring out how our two, you know, passions for this and passion for that can kind of somehow move together in a forward direction. Like, I love all that stuff, but I don't like just like generic sales of like, make the calls, send the emails, you know, do all these things that a lot of times you end up doing in startup situations, especially. And then you, of course, you do them forever and other as you go along. So I just wanted to be more of an investor um, type person who didn't have to do that, not didn't have to do those. I didn't want to do those things directly. I don't mind advising on those things, but it wasn't my thing that I, I was, I, I did that enough. Kind of looked at it like I paid my dues maybe. Um, so I, uh, I said, well, you know, I'm going to take a different approach than I have before is I'm going to just start talking to people. And I started doing what I call a walk and talk. And then out of the walk and talk, I kind of created this, this wandering Kung Fu master approach to entrepreneurship from, from my perspective. And what I said was, I'm just going to, if I'm interested in like talking with somebody, like, like we met at a party or we met out on the street or whatever, and I want to continue the conversation, I'll just say, let's go for a walk. Let's do walk and talk. And they're like, what's a walk and talk? I'm like, two rules to the walk and talk. You dress comfortably and you don't want anything from anybody. And politics and religion is okay. Mm. Because if we can't talk to each other like two human beings, then like, why are we even going to talk to each other? Like, we can disagree on stuff. Like, and if that's not cool with you, then like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Like, we have to be able to talk to each other. So I went with it. So I started doing that with zero expectations. Um, just kind of like randomly, the, the, the fourth guy that I ended up doing a walk and talk with happened to own a hundred million dollar hotel chain. Um, and then in that conversation, inevitably business and converse, you know, business and entrepreneurship conversations come up. And so then we started talking and then he said, hey, how can I get you to help me with that? And I said, I don't know. I'm the wandering Kung Fu master. <laughs> you tell me how you can get me to help me with that, right? Like, I don't know. Like, like that's how it works. That's, that's how I'm doing this. You know, so he made me an offer of something that he's like, hey, can you help me with this to get me from point A to point B? And I'm like, yep, I can do that. And I, he paid me very well and um, probably took me a couple hours a week worth of time. And so I, I did, my hourly rate was really high. Um, and, um, and then that same system has kind of unfolded in numerous ways over the last two years, especially with COVID. There were a lot of opportunities that kind of came my way for me to help people. And I helped lots of people who I never like, made a dollar from it was really just me wanting to help entrepreneurs and help them get through where they're at while other ones there were um, financial opportunities there for me that i've made both in terms of like advising fees as well as investment opportunities i'm uh, every every advising fee i've gotten paid so far i've reinvested in more in some other company that i met through this process so like my advising fees are really just a way of kind of like okay cool like you're committed to working together great and then I end up usually just taking those and investing them in somebody else's, or maybe even that person, like you never know. Um, Cause a lot of the people I'm investing in almost all in the short term, for sure, are all people who've come out of this process. Um, people that I've met and that I'm helping move along. Because when you think about it as an investor, wouldn't I just prefer to work with the people that I already know? And I've already know all the ins and outs of like, unlike when I was buying companies and I had to do all that diligence and I had to figure it out and, making reference to that article that you guys were reading, you're always surprised. You don't like, there's always a surprise so far in this case, I invest in something. I know all the surprises because I've been talking to these guys for, you know, every week for the last year, you know, or 18 months, whatever it's been. Um, that's a really good way to like invest in a business because you, you kind of know what's up. So anyway, that's been my approach more recently has been that, uh, that more wandering Kung Fu master investor strategy, which now I've become more associated. I've, I've um, connected with a bunch of VC groups, which I'm making introductions to, to the people that I work with, the companies that I work with. So like, there's a lot of like cross um, kind of connections and resource sharing that I can kind of bring together because I have this wide view. Um, so I'm always thinking efficiency and connections kind of like the same as I used to do on a company level, because I will talk about those things at a company level. But then I've kind of been able to um, get a broader view across all my companies, as I like to refer to them, um, to figure out how there's connections that can be made or how I can bring in financing for these guys or 
connect these guys to a bank that I know that might be able to help them with what they're trying to accomplish or whatever. Yeah. So, I love that. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think there are a couple of things to unpack there. And then I, I actually do want to circle back and talk a little blockchain for a minute if we've got time. Um, but what, what I love a lot about what you were just talking about, I mean, actually I can sort of empathize or I can relate to what you're talking about and how, you know, sales isn't your jam, but really relationship development is because that's sort of the, the stuff that I love doing as well. And uh, I think what I like about it so much, and this is is clear as day on on your sort of, I guess would be considered a consultative website or a personal website. Um, mm-hmm. You you basically just spell everything out in black and white. You're wildly transparent. You just share all the data, include you know all the way down to you know what your last fee received was, just so yeah. that people have like a gauge before they even get to you. And I, I think that that little bit of transparency. I mean, even in the spirit of of you know relationship development being so open and being so transparent, you know, immediately sort of reveals the kind of character you are and the kind of person that you're, you you know, should one choose to engage with you, they kind of know what they're getting before they get in. And I I think that that's really great. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just wanted to say, um, you know, I I think for a lot of people, and I think this is scary, especially if you're the breadwinner and you've got to put, you know, food on the plate. So maybe it's got to be a part-time hustle or something. But, you know, when you can work, in a position where you're not dying for the next check, you're not trying to get something or, or, you know, you're not trying to squeeze something out of somebody and you can just have a conversation and, you know, maybe it goes somewhere, maybe it doesn't. But I, I think being allowed to have those types of conversations that are basically not, you know, have no strings attached, I think do so much in terms of business development, you know, and relationship development in terms of building trust and, and all that sort of stuff that then ultimately manifests itself. So it's, it's funny how just, sort of putting out into the universe that, you know, I'm not being greedy. I'm not just trying to take your money. I'm not trying to do this and that, and that I actually mean you well, you know, sort of manifests itself into a a pretty healthy living. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what else I'd recommend something that you kind of pointed out there. Um, I'd recommend to people when they're trying to make the leap from maybe the put, you know, I got to put the food on the table. I'm trying to get my job to become an entrepreneur, or I already have a small business that's just not doing what I need it to do and I need to make it better. My, my major recommendation on that is just to shift your mindset from like, I need to make sales, I need to make money to how do I drive value for someone? Like always revert it back to that question in your mind because if you can say, how do I drive value for someone? What do they want and what do they need and how do I get that to them? you never have to do sales again, basically, is what it comes down to. Because if, if it's abundantly clear, th- there was something I learned in, in, in an economics class way back when that basically said, nobody pays more than um, what something's worth. So if something's worth $100, they're always going to pay less than $100, right? Because if, if it's not worth more, if it's, if it's worth $100 to me, I'm not going to pay more than $100. So you have to figure out how to deliver that hundred dollars for less than a hundred dollars so you can make your profit. Um, and they'll, they'll happily give you the, the money when you've got the, when you've got the value clearly, you know, if they're like, Hey, that's worth a hundred dollars. I'm going to pay 95 for it, but it costs you $80 to make it perfect. That's a, like, that is no brainer. Like think of it in terms of financial um, products. You know, if I was going to buy a bond that has a face value of a thousand dollars, okay, let's take cost of, you know, you know, time value of money and all the inflation and all that out of the equation. But the point is, if I'm going to buy something for a, that has a face value of a thousand dollars for $950, I will do, I will give you all my money. Like I'll, I'll give you, every, if I could do that consistently, I will give you all my money. So that's how you have to think of your business in general is if you can drive so much value and, and you're, and you're because that person sees it that way that it's a hundred dollars and you're going to sell it to me for ninety five, perfect. I'll I'll do that all day long. Well, yeah, I think you, you make a great point about just value, you know, and and understanding. You you mentioned it sort of in conversation or sort of flippantly, but that's worth a hundred dollars to me, right? Exactly. So, so it's not just even about what you think. It's about you know what does your consumer think or what does it, you know the person who's engaging with your product or service you know, what do they think your product is worth? So to sort of just reinforce your point, the idea that you need to be delivering on the value, you know, is what's going to drive up that perceived value by whoever the end user is. So I I think that's a great point. And listen to your customers because 95 plus percent of entrepreneurs that I know and that I've seen, um, 
they build a business around what they think is a good idea. And then they try to convince everyone that it's a good idea. It's much easier to listen to what your customer thinks is a good idea first and then build that. Well, um, and I actually really like the, the walk and talk conversations that you do because those kind of conversations, you're able to get those, you know, pull that yeah. out of your customer in an informal way and just have that conversation while talking. And you can actually kind of define what they need and what is of value to them in a, you're not sitting around a table in an office trying to hash that out. You're just having a walk and you're having a legit conversation with them, which you'll get more clarity out of the equation versus right. just sitting there and coming into a business meeting, which I love that. So. And to keep it honest, you have to approach it knowing that you're going to give fully to this person while you're doing that. Like you, you give the information, you provide as much engagement in that conversation as possible with zero expectations of getting anything out of it because then it's honest and then you're providing you're showing and proving that you're providing value now and then then like i said that's then it just turns into like oh hey look we have a connection here there's something i can do for you long term that's helpful you know or maybe there isn't maybe i could just help you along the way and you move along and good for you you know i'm glad i was able to help like that's the approach honestly if the whole world worked like that like we, everyone would be better off. So agreed. Yeah. yeah. Our philosophy around that, it's very similar actually to your walk and talk is just this, uh, this concept that you have to break bread to make bread, right? If you want, if you want to make money, you got to break bread. You got to sit down and have these conversations. And, and again, the whole point is in, in person interaction, you know, just being able to have these free flowing conversations that aren't based on, or, you know, predicated on any return. And, uh, and I, and I think it's just absolutely critical, uh, critical for relationship building. For sure. For sure. Cool. Well, so Ryan, did, cool. did you have a question yeah. on blockchain before we take off? I think you. Yeah. I wanted that. to circle back to it. And uh, yeah. Um, so in, in 81 C as you were talking about, the idea was that you could have sort of this uh, and I'll probably butcher this a little bit. So feel free to fix me. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea was basically that you were capable of registering, you know, anybody worldwide could invest in an organization. And basically you you were using blockchain technology as a way of sort of proving your purchase or proving your investment. Right. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about just how that worked. And, and one of the reasons is a little bit selfish for me, but I've been trying to figure out how to build some level of, of blockchain technology into my business. For example, I, I run a, a marketing and design company mm -hmm. and I have a lot of thoughts around blockchain as sort of almost like a replacement for the trademark office or the copyright office. Sure. And, uh, and so I'm really interested in it. You know, I sell NFTs and I sell all kinds of stuff. So I have some experience in it, but for people who don't really understand the blockchain, don't know what it is, or, or, you know, it's an emerging technology and people don't have their heads wrapped around it. Do you mind talking about just, first of all, what it is, Second of all, how you were able to apply it in your organization and, yeah. uh, you know, what you think sort of the future of that technology is. Yeah, good question. So just as a, you know, high level overview, which I'm sure you both are aware, but if, if there's listeners that aren't, um, high level overview is basically um, blockchain is like a distributed immutable database. So basically that it's a, it's a, it's a sing, one version of the truth. I can call back that phrase. It's a single <laughs> version of the truth. Uh, a, 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 like a grandmaster database that um, no one can change without everyone know that it was knowing that it was changed. So therefore, when I put something into the database that says, you know, Ryan owns this piece of real estate, for example, he owns that piece of real estate because we all agreed to it. We put it in there and it can't be changed by anybody. So that's what allows you to have kind of basically a unique um, cause the problem on the internet is the duplicate payment problem or like currencies, right? Um, duplicate payments. Like I can, if I had a, a digital token, uh, without blockchain, I could just copy that token and give it to somebody else. And then the token has no value where, because you can say this particular string of numbers represents this token. And we all agree that's the token. And this is the guy who's holding onto it at this moment. That's what allows it to work. So that's kind of like blockchain in general. And obviously for our use case, it was very clear. It was a stock certificate basically, right? Like back in the old days, they literally would send you a piece of paper with a number on it that was officially, you know, um, issued by the company that represented a share of the company. And so um, really the technology 
conceptually works exactly the same way. Um, and that's exactly what we used it for uh, with the um, token offering and the tokenized equity. That's okay. amazing. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think that, I mean, I think that there's obviously a lot of applications for it. So I just love hearing how people are using this technology in their own businesses, because, you know, they, there's one version of it that people see in the news or whatever, that's Bitcoin and that kind of thing. But there are just so many applications for this. And it is funny, you know, that it does relate back to it's almost the, the future of your, you know, single source database. You know, it, it's right. this is the, the next iteration of that. So right. I, right. I yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of opportunity in blockchain. I think because of its scale, like I said earlier about the shipping thing, because of its potential scale, the entry point in which it becomes useful is probably going to be exponential. It's going to be one of those things where we're, you know, right now it's kind of, there's these like fringe applications. And when we say fringe, we talk about a multi-trillion dollar cryptocurrency world, right? So, but that's fringe at this point still. So, um, you know, there's these fringe uses, there's the NFT market, which is just like going crazy. Um, so like these different use cases, but I think just like the internet, it'll kind of sort of plot along of like, here's this case, here's that case, here's this case. And then before you know it, it's integrated through all sorts of things. And it's just like part of our existence. And I don't think we're gonna be able to, I won't be able to predict like what industry or what market is the tipping point for that, you know, like really that revolution to kind of, to kind of happen. Um, and it might happen, because of the way blockchain works, it might happen in pieces. Like it might be, it might take over a whole industry, which I guess is kind of how the internet went too. The kind of take over industry by industry, yeah. you know, as time goes by, as people figure out how to integrate it and be able to make that change within that industry in a way that is reasonable because you can't get everyone to do it all at once. Like it has to be modular. It has to be a modular change um, in order for it to work. No, I think it'll be really exciting and, uh, and interesting to see what's going on uh, in the future. So here in these closing couple minutes, um, do you just want to share with our audience where people can engage with you, where they can find you online, or if they're interested in your consulting work or, or anything else? Yeah. yeah, so first let me just say that I am as open to talk to people as I appear to be. Like I, I talk to people about all sorts of things. Um, so reach out to me. It's like however you want to get a hold of me. Um, if you look me up on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I don't check that that much, <laughs> but I am on there if you want to read about me. Um, and uh, my website's thebigda.com. That was the one you noted earlier, thebigda.com. And I think there's an email address on there. So if you get a hold of me, I think you'll be able to find me. So give it a give it a whirl. And uh, I'm happy to talk with anyone about any subject whether it's business or philosophy or any of the above. So I love that. Well, thank you, Dan. I really appreciate your time. It's been a great conversation and I've learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners have as well. So thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Guys. It's been awesome. And uh, thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week, and we'll see you all next time.